Hey everybody. So this is our lesson for Friday, uh, April the 17th. And so um, last time I left you, we were just barely sticking our, dipping our little toe into integer programming. And I taught you one method, which was using cutting planes. Um, not anybody's favorite method. And uh, we didn't even really do a true example because I, I'm not going to require you to do that at all. Just wanted you to know the idea behind how cutting planes works. Now, we're going to uh, do the other method that's widely used called branch and bound. And it's actually kind of got a similar flavor to cutting planes. Okay. Now, before I dive too deeply into it, I want to kind of give us a few facts that we're going to use. And we actually know some of these facts. Okay. So the first fact is, if you have any basic feasible solution, okay, any, any corner point, any extreme point, any, so it doesn't have to be the optimal one, just any basic feasible solution, and let's say it's the primal maximum LP. Okay, so the, the big part here is we're doing a maximum problem, maximization problem. <coughs> so it gives us the lower bound on the optimal objective function value. Oops, and I can't draw a straight line. Okay, so what does that mean? That means if I pick any corner point and I'm trying to maximize, it will give me a Z. So Z is, uh, say the objective function is seven. Then I know that the optimal solutions objective function is gonna be seven or higher. I, I should not find an optimal that's less, that, that should make sense to you, right? So, so look at one like this. This, this, just plain linear programming problem, okay? So let's actually look at every single one of the basic feasible solutions. Let me do this so it's not all overwhelming at once, get too much going on. <coughs> so there's every single one of its corner points. It's a very simple one if you wanted to graph it. You could see all the corner points. It's got just a uh, horizontal and a vertical constraint and then one that cuts through diagonally. And so it just has these basic feasible solutions. So one, two, three, four, five, only five of them. So there's all five of them and there's all their Z values. So if you pick any of them, this is kind of like a no duh common sense thing, but if I pick any of them, so say I picked, I think I picked three one below. So say I picked three one, that's not the optimal, I get an objective function of 5. That means if I look at anything that is below 5, I know it's not the optimal. I know the optimal has got to be 5 or larger. And of course the optimal is 7 here. Um, so this just explains all of that. Um, that <coughs> it could be equal to 5 if this is the optimal that I randomly picked. Okay, But it will not be less than that. It will certainly not be smaller. It could be larger since it's, it might not be the optimal. So just this weird understanding is kind of a no-duh, but if I pick any basic feasible solution, the optimal will be equal to or larger its objective function value. Is everybody with me on that? I know, it seems kind of stupid, but it will help us here in a second with branch and brown. Just this understanding that if I pick an extreme point and get a solution, the optimal objective function value will be equal to or larger. Okay, certainly not smaller. <clears throat> the second fact, I'm allowed to take, let's see, take any um, integer programming problem and I can add a constraint. Like I could say, oh, let's make x bigger than 2. So it's got to be over here, you know, and, and I can add constraints. <clears throat> Think about this. If I were to add a constraint, say I say x x1 has got to be larger than 1, and so I add a constraint, or a half, and that cuts off some of the feasibility. So what did I do? I shrank the feasibility region, right? So if I now optimize the blue as opposed to the original red, I could get the same optimal, right? But what if I happen, what if one of these were the optimal and I chopped it off? That means the optimal I will get will be smaller than that, right? So as I add constraints, 
that's what I'm saying here as I add constraints the new optimal will be no larger than the other objective function the optimal of the old objective function function okay that means it'll be smaller than or equal to it'll be equal to if it's if I did not chop off the optimal with this constraint and it will be smaller to it if I did chop off the optimal with this constraint does that make sense to everybody so I'm going to be shrinking the the space that that's just is what this all says right here I will be making the space smaller by adding more constraints okay so if if you kind of get these two ideas they both should be kind of common sense ideas even without too much theory that's, that's a lot of the driving force behind the branch and bound method okay so you could guess we're going to be doing something adding <clears throat> adding constraints and and looking at lower bounds or upper grounds or things that are going to be smaller or larger and comparing things so that's kind of how we're going to do this now before I begin I've been mentioning giving you a homework that would have you use one of the solvers I decided to hold that homework and I'm going to assign you one homework problem that comes from this branch and bound because you will be using the solver to save you large amounts of time. Okay, so I will do that here so you can watch and figure out how to do your homework problem. It'll be exactly like the example that I'm going to work on the next slide. Okay, <clears throat> so we're about ready to attempt a branch and bound. So what's going to happen is we will go about branching and we need to figure out when we need to stop a branch. There are three reasons. So what we're going to do is we're going to end up making a tree. Take nodes and make a, just a, a tree graph. Okay. And at some point I have to decide. I say, hey, let's stop this one. There's no need to go any further. And let's stop this one. There's no need to go any further. There are three reasons we're going to stop. One is you stop when you get an integer solution. Okay. So this one ends up giving me x is 2, 5. Those are integers. Those are whole numbers. And so I can stop here. I do not have to keep going and branching. Okay. The other reason to stop is once I try a new spot, this node is infeasible. I'm not going to keep going with that train of thought trying to solve a problem that's infeasible. Okay. And then finally, the last reason to stop, say I decide to stop here, is that I find I solve a problem I get the z-value is something like 7 but it's already smaller than this z-value of 8 <clears throat> because of those two facts that I gave you earlier on the last page there's no need for me to explore here anymore let me explain you'll see when we do the example as I branch and go down the tree each time I branch, I'm adding a constraint, okay, to constrict the problem more. So as I branch and constrict the problem more, below any node, the z value is either equal to or smaller. If I'm trying to maximize something and I'm looking for the largest z value, once I hit 7, if I decide to try to branch anymore, all of these are going to be 7 or smaller. They will definitely be smaller than 8 so none of these can be the optimal so that means 8 has got to be our optimal or this point 2 5 does that make hopefully that makes sense it also uses the um the first fact <clears throat> that um, if I get one of these I know that the optimal is that or larger so there's no need to keep going down okay so those two facts serve that to help us know when to stop because I don't want to enumerate every single integer combination. Okay, <clears throat> so in theory you could use branch and bound to cycle through every single possible integer feasible feasible integer point. Okay, but we don't want to do that because the complexity of that would be horrible and it would cost a whole lot as far as computing goes and computation and your little hand writing on a piece of paper would die from doing this so in theory you almost never have to go and enumerate the whole tree it's it's kinda like the simplex method the simplex method in theory has decent complexity but not beautiful complexity 
but in practice it's usually um, solves poly in polynomial time. And same thing with the branch and bound. It usually gives you in practice a really, really good way to get to a solution. So let's actually work an example because I know it's kind of awkward seeing me do this if you've never seen branch and bound wondering what am I talking about. So that's kind of where we're going next is just to do an example. So here's our example. We're going to maximize <clears throat> this objective function value. And I have these constraints, three constraints. Okay. Whew. And then notice that it, I say that these two x's have to be integers. So this is an integer problem. So here's what we're going to do. Okay. We're going to say, okay, let's just see. We're going to start at what we call node 0. Different people use different notations, but I put my node and I put my number inside it. Okay. And we're just going to solve this thing, but we're going to ignore that and solve it as an LP. Okay, this is where I will use um, a solver to save time because each node is going to be its own LP. So maybe I should write that as a note. At each node, we'll solve a new LP and we can solve this really quickly and easily using a solver and since we know how to use um, this one let me get rid of that um, edit cut cell there we go so make sure I have this incorrectly I believe that's the problem uh, 3 5 2 4 1 0 0 1 28 5, 8, and 5. Did I have 25 or 28? 25, okay. So this is the problem. I already had it put in just exactly how we solved using this last time. Remember, you had to switch it to a minimization problem, so my z will be opposite signed. Okay. So, control, enter. Boom. So this is what we get. Okay. <coughs> we get a function value of 35.25 and we picked up on the point 8, 2.25. So let me write that out. What I do is at each node, I write out what what the x point we're at. What was it? I believe it was 8 and 2.25. And z was 35.25. So the very first thing you should ask yourself, is this an integer x value, x point? No, because this is a decimal. So if that were integer, I'd be done. I'm good. I found it. Yay. There's no need to go any further. But it's not. So now we do what's called branching. So I'm going to branch. This is amazing, the thought process behind it, because it's very simple. Well, what makes this not integer is this one, the 2.25. Could I add a constraint to try to make it integer, maybe not make it integer, but say, hey, I don't want 2.25, let's chop off 2.25. So there are two directions I could go with this, right? I could say, hey, x2 has got to be less than or equal to 2. That would cut this off right at a integer point, right? What's the other way I could go with it? I could say x2 has got to be greater than or equal to 3. So notice this is 2.25, so I'll go with the integer below it and the integer above it and I would like to do it solve an LP where I'm less than or equal to and where I'm greater than or equal to okay so I'm gonna add this constraint into my linear programming problem that I'm solving in my solver okay and I'll end up with these two new nodes node 1 and node 2 and then we'll see what to do from there so let me add x2 is less than or equal to 2 Okay, so that one, let's see here. Let me add another, whoops, I forgot the comma there. And let's see, and it says it's gotta be less than or equal to two. Awesome, so I added that other constraint in, in the A matrix, it's just x2, so zero, one, x, that's x1, that's x2. It's got to be, remember, and all these are set up to do less than or equal to's already. Less than or equal to 2. So let me hit um, Control-Enter and run it. 
And look, we actually get an integer point, 8 to objective function value of 34. Let's go write that at that node. So what am I writing that information in blue? So this is, the x coordinate is 8, 2, and z is 34. Now, I guess I'll put these in boxes. Since I got an integer x value for x1 and x2, I will not branch anymore off of node 1. This node is going to be what they call pruned. I'm done. We're cutting here. So now let's go look over here and solve this new LP where I add this constraint in. Now be very careful using a solver because we just added this one in. I need to take this one out and put back in this one. So I don't want to use less than or equal to 2. I'm using greater than or equal to 3. Now just as a little side note, remember the solver we're using only will do less than or equal to 2's. So I need an equivalent to greater than or equal to 3, which is negative x2 is less than or equal to negative 3. That's the same, same constraint. So let's go back to the solver, solve this new problem. So instead of less than or equal to 2, I'm going to go less than or equal to, uh, it was negative 3. Okay. And control enter. Be very careful with that, okay? And I got 34.5 and 6.53. So not quite an integer, but that's okay. Let me get my blue here. So what did I get? I got uh, x is, oh, I wanted blue. Why is it writing in green? x is, what was it, 6.5 and 3. And z was uh, 30. 4.5. So now I do want to point out a few things. Maybe I'll wait to point this out. But as I go down a branch, notice the z, the objective function value, is dropping as I go down. I've only gone down one layer. But as I go down here, this is not an integer. So I don't need to prune it for that reason. Is this smaller than 34? No, so I don't need to prune it. Is it feasible? Yes. Okay, so now let's try to see if I can branch on this one okay so now here's where we have to be really careful with the constraints we have I'm going to branch here I need to fix x1 and so I will consider x1 is less than or equal to 6 and x1 is greater than or equal to 7 okay node 3 and 4 now because it is on this branch here, this time, because it's including x is greater than or equal to 3, I don't want to remove this constraint that I just added. I want to add in another constraint. So this has one, two additional constraints added to the original. Okay? So as you follow a branch down, these constraints are all being stacked up. So I'm going to have this one, which is already written in there, and then I will add this one where x1 is less than or equal to 6. So let's go solve that. Oh, so I need to add another constraint. 1, 0. Because this x1 is less than or equal to, oh, what was the number? Dang it, 6. Less than or equal to 6. And let me control enter and run this. So isn't it great using a solver? You don't have to resolve the LP by hand did all the simplex pivots so let's see I got 6 3.25 and I got 34.25 okay so let me go add all this information right here get my blue pen let's see at node 3 we get 6 3.25 and Z is 34.25 okay so do I get to stop here? Is 34.25 smaller than 34? No. So I can keep going. Is it integer? No, because we got this 3.25. So I'm allowed to keep branching here. Now before I go down and branch here, let's take a look at this one. Okay, now look at what constraints I'm going to want to have added to the original. The x is greater than or equal to 3, and x is greater than or 7. Equal to 7. 
I don't want this one in there because this branch doesn't include it, right? So let's remove this one and add this one, okay? So that's the one I just added, right? So adding that one in would be negative x1 is less than or equal to negative 7. So let's control enter and whew, look at what it says. It says success false. Read what it says. It says phase one of the simplex method failed to find a feasible solution. Okay, you don't need to read anymore. Besides way down here, it's infeasible. Okay, look at this. This should also be funny. Our value, our z is 36. We'll go back and look. It's supposed to be going down as we go down. It's 34 and a half. 36 would be going up. But that's because with this, these two constraints added, this is an infeasible problem. So I can stop at this branch. Four will not branch anymore. So all I have is three that might branch some more. Okay. So let's branch on X2 again. Let me get my green pen and draw my two branches. And the nodes are uh, where am I at? Four or five in node 6 and what constraints am I adding x2 it's got to be less than or equal to 3 and this one says x2 has got to be greater than or equal to 4 okay now what added constraints are going to be to the original x is greater than or equal to 3 x is less than or equal to 6 and then this one or this one so I'll do this problem first so I got to, right now if I go to my code, I have this constraint added. I need to remove that constraint and add back in less than or equal to 6. And then add less than or equal to 3. So let me go do that. So this is, x1 is less than or equal to 6. And then I need to add the new one. And the new one is what? x2, so 0, 1 is less than or equal to what was it three or two three three and hit control enter and it solves oh we got another integer six three check the function value 33 okay so let's write that down there we get um x equals six three this one's integer z is at 33 so we do not have to branch off of five anymore because we have an integer solution, 6, 3. That's awesome. Okay, so let's check 6 to see if we need to branch anymore. Okay, node 6. So I got to take out this constraint and put in x2 is less than or greater than or equal to 4, which with our solver, I got to do negative x2 is less than or equal to negative 4. And let me run it, control enter. 33 and a half, 4.5 and 4. So not, not an integer. So let's see, the x is 4.5 and 4. Uh, my 0.5 looks sloppy. And our z is 33.5. Okay. Oh, does that mean I need a branch again? And the answer is actually, no, I can stop now. Why can't I stop? It looks like I should have to branch again. But as you go down, what's happening to the Z value? It's going down. Look, track it. 35.25, 34.5, 34.25, Why can't I stop here? Well, I'm at 33.5. I have an integer solution, A2, which has a higher Z value. So I don't need to go anymore here. So let's kind of, let's see, what can I use? Big X's maybe? Big red X's. So this branch right here is infeasible. I can stop. There's no need to go anymore. This one, while I still have non-integers, I am less than the optimal, which is those two facts we were talking about. I'm less than 34. So this one, I can stop. There's no need to go any further. Why? Because as I go down, it's just going to get smaller. So I already have a better solution up here than right here. Okay. 
Now, that only leaves, the answer is going to be at the end of a branch. That only leaves these two, but it's easy to inspect and see which one is the optimal. Which one's the maximum? 33 or 34? 34. This is the optimal. Okay. So if you need to watch that part again to make sure you understand how and why we stop each branch, please do. Um, also, I hope you understand how I did each branch. Looking at the non-integer value, so the x2 or x1 on this one, and then saying, okay, well, let's force it to be, let's get rid of this 0.25. We'll say it less than or equal to 3 or greater than or equal to 4. And I used my solver. Okay. So, node 1's optimal. So, node 1 is optimal. And let's see what we got. We got z equals 34, and x is 8, 2. Awesome. So we have the optimal. It is an integer. And notice all I had to do was solve LPs, which we know how to do. So I didn't really have to do anything like going through all the combinations of all the integer points. Now, when we solved the original one, notice it was x, 2.5, and if you were just to round this to the closest integer point, you would have gotten that. I had an email from one of the students saying, look, it seems like all the examples we've looked at, rounding would work. Or, and the person came up with some great ideas, like using geometric distance to the closest um, integer point. Or um, using the isoprofit line, just looking at the integers. And that all works in two dimensions. Once I get in higher dimensions, that some of our spatial awareness falls apart once you're in five or six dimensions because we can't visualize how the spaces interact. So um, we're doing simple problems like two variables to keep this from being a giant tree or, or to keep it from being too insane. Um, so most of the time you know the answer is going to be like, oh, you really probably could just round because that almost always works with something as simple as two dimensions. But when I'm in more dimensions, the more convoluted this is going to get. But this is the technique called branch and bound. This is a nice way to solve integer programming problems. Um, I'll send you a homework. Like I said, use, use the solver to solve. All I need to see when you turn in your homework is just your tree. And I want to see it just like this with the, the points, the constraints you're adding at each, each branch, the Z value, and then tell me what's optimal. Okay? Well, that's all I have for you tonight. I hope you'll have an awesome, awesome Friday and a good weekend. I'll see you on Monday.